Good morning, everybody. Hi. Hi. Um, welcome. My name is Mimi Kunin. I'm a new member of the NADA board, and it's my pleasure this morning to be able to introduce an exciting session on apprenticeships. So I want you all to sit back and listen to Jan Vonderhoop, who's going to be talking to us about, so you're in the right program, <laughs> Apprenticeship That Works, Innovative Approaches from Different Industries and Places. And I'm so excited to hear about how apprenticeships can really impact the workforce world, because it's really an important tool, and I'm excited to see what you have to say. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Mimi. I appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday morning. We're in the home stretch. Um, there's a lot of very tired looking people outside wandering around, so I appreciate you actually taking a deep breath and joining me this morning. Um, as Mimi said, my name's Jan Vanderhoop. Um, I am, you know, if, if, if I had engaged with one of you as a youth, I'm not sure you'd have known what to do with me, honestly. Um, so I'm, I'm one of these people who has had a completely non-linear career path. I, I, um, I thought I was going to university for engineering, ended up going into business, specializing in hotel and food administration, started on the operations side as a management trainee, was tapped to go into HR for six months, what I thought was six months, and that ended up being the next 15 years of my career in three different corporations. Um, realized at, uh, in my late 30s, so it was 1998, 1999, um, I came to terms with the fact that even though I could do the corporate thing really well, it was, I was a misfit. I was just tired of doing the dance, even though I could do it. And so uh, opted out, um, started my first business where I sort of pulled together a lot of the stuff that I'd done over my career, which was, you know, working in many respects at the intersection of people and organizational systems, working with some very cool organizations um, in that space, really doing a lot of leadership development, teaching coaching skills to managers and leaders in organizations as a way for them to build their leadership, to build their followership in many respects, change the conversation, shift relationships, build trust, all the rest of that stuff. And as life would have it, I, I, kept, I started noticing a pattern in many of these great organizations that I was working in. And, and it showed up a couple of different ways, depending on the organization, but it was all about people. And, and I was discovering a legion of people in these really cool organizations whose light had gone out. When they joined the company 15, 20 years previously in many cases, they were on fire. They were lit up. They loved their work. They were proud to work for the company. They were excited to go in every day. They were doing great work. There was a buzz to them that had somehow been extinguished over time. And, uh, and they, st they still kept showing up at work, but the joy had gone out of it for them. And, and in, in a lot of respects, what had happened was the, the world around them had changed over the course of those years. And so my question to them became about, well, what shifted in your fit? And, and almost always it was about, well, my manager changed or so-and-so left the department and I got saddled with their job, with their work, only because I would, I'd been, I was the only one left who knew how to do it. And I went from doing work that I loved to work, to, to work that I got saddled with and it started to get heavy or whatever, just changes in the organization. So this thing about fit started to show up in my face over and over and over again. And at the same time, I was working in some hospitality organizations and with some retailers who were having a really tough time, not only filling senior level positions to fuel their growth, so they were hiring in people with impeccable pedigrees who had done in, their, in, in other organizations exactly what my client needed them to hit the ground running and deliver fast. And what I kept hearing from these clients was, you know, we're sick and tired of hiring the resume and firing the person. You know, we're taking them through this in-depth vetting process. We're screening them. We're interviewing them. We're showing them around. We're making sure that, they've done, that, that, that they should be able to deliver our organization what we need them to do. And yet we discover when they come on board, we can't let them interface with our people because they're toxic or they're not like us. 
and so they become like a callus in the organization that gets in the way of getting things done. So that was, that was sort of a, a, a constant refrain. The other pain point in those organizations was they weren't hiring enough people into entry-level positions who were growable in the organization. So they were bringing in people who were great, for example, store-level associates, but not enough who could be promoted to um, junior managers, to key holders, to others up in the organization, and so that pump wasn't priming the way they needed it to. And so the, the question that I kept getting from my clients was, how can we do a better job of bringing in the right people for our business? And, and that was a tough one, because when I sat down with the HR teams in these organizations to understand their process for screening people in, for you know, going through stacks of resumes, for pre-screening, for phone screens, for face-to-face -face interviews, if I look back on my experience in corporate HR in three really cool organizations, so Hilton International Hotels, PepsiCo, Office Depot, three companies that really had it buttoned down on the people side. If I'd, if I'd sat down with these clients and taken them through a list of best practices, the challenge was they were doing all of those best practices pretty well. So something was clearly missing. I couldn't go back to the CEO and say, HR is doing everything right, because clearly they're having all these pain points in their organization. So that's what got us scratching below the surface to really understand what are the key drivers of success in organizations? What's the grease that allows people to come in more seamlessly and integrate and engage and do really well? And that got us up the whole pathway of fit and understanding how to measure job fit as a predictor of success. And we'll talk a bit about how that fits into the recipe that I'm gonna share with you this morning. So we're, we're, a, we're a participant in the story. We're not the hero of the story that I have to share with you this morning. The hero of the story is um, an organization called Support Ontario Youth. And, uh, and that was a not-for-profit that was established by an electrical trade association. So in that case, it's the Ontario Electrical League, whose members are all small and mid-sized electrical contractors. You've, you have associations exactly like these in your community. They represent small employers. In this case, and, and I guarantee you it's the same at home, you know, the, every one of their members was having a terrible time with a chronic labor shortage. You know, there, there's a scarcity of people who are skilled tradespeople. There's a scarcity of people, we think, who are interested in being apprentices. And every one of their member companies was suffering terribly. And so the, the league stepped up and, and, and said, as an association, we can probably do more as a collective than any one of our members can do individually. And so let's see what we can do to, to, to resolve this chronic talent shortage that exists in our industry. And, and, I, and, and theirs is the story that I want to tell because it's, it's, I think, informative to all of us around what we might want to achieve in our own communities. I'm scrolling to the very end just for a second to catch your attention because as we talk about the results that they've been able to generate, it's been spectacular. So this is now, we're in our fourth year working with soy. Every year since they turned on the lights, they have at least doubled their hiring objectives. So you talk about going from absolute scarcity to abundance, these guys have achieved it. All, right? All of a sudden, they're finding people coming out of the woodworks who not only are interested in being electrical apprentices, but they're actually really well suited to those jobs. And so their big challenge now isn't so much recruiting the labor side of the equation. Their challenge now is going beyond their membership to bring in other employers in the industry to absorb this glut that they've got of people who want to come and become apprentices. Satisfaction rates are through the roof. You know, when, when I speak to organizations, one of the stats that I'll put up is some research that's been done by uh, Leadership IQ over the years. And, and it's a really simple survey. What they, what they do is they interview people who've been hired in the last 90 days, they interview managers who hired them, and they ask both parties, was this a really good decision? At, at the 90 day mark. How often do you think both thumbs are in the air? 20% of the time. 
one time in five, both the person who was hired and the manager who hired him said, yes, this was a really good decision. At which point, I'll turn to CEOs, CFOs, COOs in the room and say, where else in your business can you tolerate an 80% failure rate? It's, it's absurd. And yet we do it on the people side all day long because we just take for granted there's going to be turnover. We just take for granted that people aren't necessarily going to engage. The satisfaction rates in this program, same question asked to the apprentice and to the contractor. Last time the, uh, the results were published, it was 91.1%. It's, it's typically been between about 91 and 95%. Absolutely stellar numbers that nobody's seen anywhere else. Largely because of that, attrition has gone through the floor. They had accepted sort of a mid 40% attrition rate in the industry previously. They just accepted the fact that people are gonna come, they're gonna try this out for a little bit, they're gonna see if they like the taste, and maybe half the time they'll stick with it. 3.5%. 3.5% attrition over the four year life of this program. It's working. People are finding their bliss. People are finding something that really works for them. Employers are leaning in differently into the relationship and it's showing in the numbers. The other piece that is, I think, worthy of note, especially in today's world, in order to get the grant, um, the association had to put in some targets to diversify the trade. It was just an expectation from the government. If we're gonna write you a check, you gotta fix some ills. And so they set specific targets to bring in more women. I think the, the five categories the government was looking for was bring in more women, more newcomers, more visible minorities, uh, more indigenous, and more people with disabilities. And to their shock and delight, when they sat down with me at breakfast six months into the program, so this is nearly three years ago now, Stephen, who is the executive director, said, you know, we've been so busy getting this program up and running we really haven't been able to do any meaningful proactive outreach into those communities yet, and yet we're staggered to see that nearly a quarter of the people we've hired tick at least one of those five boxes. He said, what we've, what we've found is when we keep the resume out of the conversation for just a second and we look for people who are naturally just really well suited to the task, you can't help but end up with a more diverse group of candidates to look at. It just happens. And so we'll talk more about that a little bit later on. But, you know, I, 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 I don't want to give you any sense that the starting point in this work was a pretty picture, because it truly wasn't. First off, yes, I'm sorry, good morning. Yeah, yeah please. Did, did our process help improve the diversity numbers? Yes, and I'll, I'll let the cat out of that bag in, in just a little bit. But it really, you know, it comes down to looking for something different in people who are coming than what we're used to looking for. So I'll leave that as a bit of a teaser and we'll come back to it because it, it really is, you know, one of our clients said it's as simple as changing your glasses. And instead of looking for one thing, just looking for something completely different. And, and all of a sudden you find great people all around you. So we'll, we'll, we'll loop back to that. One thing I do want to dispel for just a second, you know, we're, a, we're, a, we're one of these anomalies. So we're a Canadian company that really has a very strong footprint on both sides of the border. We probably do 75 or 80% of our business in the US, as a matter of fact. I think that's partly um, a legacy from my corporate life where I, I spent 15 years working in Canadian subs of US organizations. So I've always been sort of binational, if you like, in some respects. It's easy to assume that apprenticeship is done so much better in Canada than it is here. It's not. So I, I don't want you coloring everything that I say with, uh, with the, 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 the quiet reassurance in your mind that, well, it's Canada, it's different. It truly is not. It's every bit as messy, every bit as broken, every bit as confusing there as it is here, just as ugly. The starting point was an environment where, frankly, people didn't know how to navigate easily. Apprentices didn't know where to start. They didn't know where to go. They had a tough time connecting with the schools that were offering the in-class training. Sometimes the classes were sold out, or sometimes 
in order to get a seat, they had to be willing to move to a different part of the province for four months to get their in-class hours. Um, employers resisted, resisted, resisted because of the administrative burden, because of the time consumed, because of the risk of taking in somebody that really is a complete novice and do I really have the resources and the wherewithal in the organization to teach a greenhorn what they, what they need to know. Um, the government's leadership in this area, so you, know, you have state departments of labor, we have a provincial ministry of labor, different language, same function. Ministry of labor is completely broken and upside down. They're confused internally. They'll give one set of directives one week and a completely different set of directives the next week. So it's, it was an ugly situation. And the result of that ugly situation was none of the parts were synchronizing properly. And because none of the parts were synchronizing properly, people were falling out and employers were avoiding the mess. And that was really at the root of many of the issues that we faced. And is, is this sounding familiar for any of you? A little bit, huh? One of the things that um, the Electrical League put in their grant proposal was a map of the apprentice's journey. And I, and I don't want you squinting to get into the detail here, but you see sort of the subway map at the top and the convolutions of the process for the apprentice. Um, the things that are in red on the slide are all the places people fall out of the process. All the places where apprentices say, you know what, I'm, I'm done trying to make this work. And there's a lot of red on that slide, all right? So, so, listen, you don't have to take pictures. I'm happy to send you the slides if you'd like to bring it home and share with your friends as, a, as something to chuckle over. But, you know, here's, here's the thing. They, they said, we've, we've got to be able to do better. So, as I said earlier on, the Electrical League created a not-for-profit called Support Ontario Youth. They submitted the grant proposal. They set themselves up as the group sponsor, and I, and I want to talk about that for just a second because that was the critical pivot point in this process for them, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk for a second about that, but they, you know, they, they, they set themselves up with the sponsor, which really put them in the center of the relationship with apprentices and with employers. And so they now became the broker of those relationships. They became the administrator of the process. They were the, the central go-to point for everybody in this ecosystem to come and help figure stuff out. The other thing that they did was they pulled together a consortium of organizations. And I'll talk about three of those. One, we are one of them. But these are companies that are involved in supporting an ecosystem in very specific ways. And every one of them has been absolutely central to the success of the program because they each deal with specific elements of things that needed to be put in place in order for this thing to work. So Stephen, as he, as he started into this process, he knew it was going to be important to create um, you know, this group sponsorship as the center of the ecosystem, but he also knew that they wouldn't be able to do it alone and they'd have to draw from specific expertise outside that and bring it into the ecosystem. So let's talk for a second about why group sponsor, right? How many of you are involved in apprenticeship programs today? Just out of curiosity, a few of you. How many would like to be? How many of you didn't put up your hand? Why are you here? <laughs> I'm glad you're here. I'm kidding. So, so here's the thing. Uh, the, it, it feels like you're on a flying trapeze as a participant in the program. And it truly, truly doesn't matter whether you're uh, somebody bumping along trying to figure out what they need to do next with their lives. I was going to say a youth, obviously, because that's in line with this program. And yet, you know, we find many of the people who come to apprenticeship are outside that envelope. The, the average person in Ontario, at least, and you may find the same thing at home, is um, the average age of somebody actually deciding they, they want to give apprenticeship a shot, whether it's the skilled trades or anywhere else, is 29. So if you think about it, these are folks who've bumped along a little bit, following the conventional wisdom. In many cases, you know, their guidance counselors at school, their parents, their ecosystem said to them, you gotta go off to college, you gotta go off at least to a two-year program, you gotta go off to a degree program. I've got, you know, I've, I, I have, um, Three daughters, so the twins are 32, the babies 28. In both cohorts, they had um, 
they had friends in their circle who got that advice. You know, we, we're in a fairly affluent neighborhood, so the guidance counselors in school are not going to send kids to apprenticeship come hell or high water. I can think of one in particular, Matt Padmore, lovely kid. He grew up in our house just like everybody else in those cohorts. I've known him since he was knee high to a grasshopper. Matt was sent off to university. Dreadful mistake. Didn't finish the first semester. Came home, moved back into his mother's basement. Felt like a failure. Went off to community college the following September. So think about it, he lost eight months of his life. Went to community college. Thought that might be a better answer for him. Nope, he was back home again before Christmas. Not the right thing for him. Two years now lost out of his life. He was working hourly jobs. Not making a lot of money. Condemned to living in his mother's basement because he wasn't getting a fresh start. He, he, he couldn't find a foothold in what was right for him. He ended up starting to work for a friend of a friend who runs a home renovation company and Matt just started working as a general laborer, getting his hands on tools, getting his hands on building materials, discovered he liked it, ended up becoming a, um, a carpentry apprentice and is loving his life now. But Matt's one of those examples of somebody who came to it late in his 20s because he had bumped along and scraped his knees and felt like a failure for so long, he felt there was nothing else to try. That shows up every day in our lives. There are oodles of people out there who are in exactly the same place. So we talk about this trapeze. You've got these people who are trying to find their way in life and frankly are ill-equipped to understand how the system works. They're ill-equipped to know where they need to go to fill in a training agreement at the, at the, at the state office. They are ill-equipped to find an employer who's willing to go and help them fill in the paperwork so that you've got, you've got a partner who's, or a, an employer who's willing to sponsor you as an apprentice. Right? Those, those two first steps for somebody who wants to be an apprentice are impossible. How am I going to find an employer who's willing to bring me on as an apprentice if I've never done this before? And what's going to be in it for them to interrupt the day to go with me to the office so that we can fill in the paperwork together so that he can then take a risk on bringing me on and, and, and starting me day to day? It's, it's impossible. It's a huge hurdle for the individual. From the employer's perspective, it's got all the same risks that we talked about earlier on, right? We're taking the chance on the person, sure. I have to interrupt my day to go look after this administrative BS to satisfy somebody else's need for a paper trail. And oh, by the way, guess what? I'm now signing up for this endless chain of paperwork that needs to happen. And so, you know, there's, there's tremendous risk, there's tremendous resistance, there are all kinds of reasons stacked up why this shouldn't work. And so the reason the group sponsor is so important is it provides that safety net. It provides that single source, that single destination for everybody in this ecosystem to go to. So an apprentice now will sign up, they become, um, their training agreement is with the group sponsor, it's not with the employer. So it's soy that is signing the registered training agreements with the individuals. It's soy that's the go-to in fact, part of what we've built for that is a job board where contractors can post their open positions for journey people and for apprentices. So if somebody's either starting the process and they need to find an employer, there's a bank for them of employers to reach out to with a single click and make the connection. And then Soy will do the paperwork for them. Or, as often happens, if somebody gets laid off because a project's finished. There's a place for them to go back to and find another employer the next day, or they go back to Soy and Soy says, let's figure this out for you, and they're working again in 24 hours. You're not leaving somebody in the lurch the way would typically be the case where they now have to go and start this process all over again, find an employer, drag them down to the government office, and do the paperwork. So, so that safety net is hugely important for the individual. Soy is there to help them figure out when they need to schedule school. They're there to help them make sure that they get to school and track their grades, make it part of the report. They do exactly the same for employers to make sure that they're properly staffed, that they've got enough people coming through the doors. And so that safety net of the group sponsor really is, I think, in many respects, maybe back to our conversation, it is the beating heart at the center of this 
that makes everything else possible. It's a critical shift in thinking that, frankly, anybody could make. It doesn't have to be an industry association. It could be a workforce board. It could be any organization that is prepared to stand in the middle and be the broker of all things to make an ecosystem work. But it requires that magnet to bring it all together. And so, really what they've done is they've taken all of the red off the chart and taken on responsibility themselves as an organization to, to make sure that it's working. Yeah. Yep. So, so the difference, I, I, I don't see a difference between group sponsor and intermediary. I, I think they function the same way. I think in a, in a group sponsor model, maybe the paperwork's different, maybe the, 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 the setup structurally is different from a legal standpoint. I can't speak so much to that, but I think, honestly, the group sponsor is functioning as an intermediary in this case. And in our experience, there are lots of other intermediaries out there different types of intermediaries, right? So in, in our model, I mean, essentially, you know, with, with the Joptimize platform, we've built a space for employers, we've built a space for people to try to figure out what they need, need to do next. We've got a, a behavioral job matching engine in the middle that, that, that helps connect people, but we've built that third space for intermediaries. So for anybody who's in the business of helping to match talent with opportunity. Workforce boards are a great example of intermediaries in our world. Soy is an example of an intermediary in our world. Community colleges are an example of an intermediary in our world. They're all using that space, they're using the tools, but they're all using it in the same way, which is to connect the right person with the right opportunity and make sure that they're off and running. I think the piece that's different in this model might be that it's less event-driven and more um, it's got a longer time frame, right? So, there, so Soy's relationship with the apprentice really is ongoing, at least to the point where they earn their journeyman papers in five years. Sometimes longer, right? So there's no reason for somebody to actually have to leave that ecosystem. But it's it's not so much about doing the match; it's about doing the match and making you're making sure you're there as a safety net throughout the entire process, which might be a shift in thinking for some intermediaries, depending how they view their role. So thank you for the question. This ecosystem that they pulled together in, in the consortium, I think, is really critical to talk about because every, every one of those organizations has a critical role to play to ensure the success of the program. Um, and if you think of it as sort of the, the value chain, the companies that are, the, the company that's ahead of us in the process is a company called TDG Marketing. And, um, and so what happened at the very outset is Support Ontario Youth created, well, TDG built them a website. It's designed as a website that traffic can be driven to, and the whole objective of that website and of somebody's experience at that site is to help them figure out whether being in the skilled trades might be right for them. So TDG's job is to drive as much traffic as they can to the site to allow people to figure out whether this might be a good choice for them. And so the user journey on the website is really straightforward. If, if, if somebody's interested in seeing if this might work for them, they're brought into a behavioral questionnaire, which is ours, which is designed to collect enough information about the individual that we can project them into an electrician job and see whether that might be a good fit for them. That's now expanded to a dozen trades, by the way, so that work continues to grow. But it's really about giving the person objective information that helps them understand whether this might be a good choice and why or why not. For many folks, it's the first time they're seeing objective information about why this might or might not be a good choice for them. So that's, that's the first piece of value, if you like, that the individual gets. And, um, and, and if they see that they're a good fit for the electrical trade or that they're maybe a better fit for carpenter or any of the other trades that are now built into this universe, there are links to day in the life information about what it's really like to be in that job. So they, they see the suit and they decide that it might or might not fit them. Then we give them with the day in the life stuff, we give them the opportunity to try on the jacket just a little bit and see if it really fits, right? And it's, and it's not glorified, it's, it's what it's really like, how you're gonna be spending your time. Are you gonna be crawling around in the dirt and mud under a building at two o'clock in the morning? 
fixing somebody's plumbing. I mean, that's, but, but, but it's a balanced story. It's people who've been in that job, who are enjoying that job, talking about what they love about it, and sometimes what's not so attractive. And so what's happening in the process now is people are engaging with the website on the front end. They're able to, number one, form a much better opinion themselves of whether this is something that might appeal to them. So they're moving forward with better information than they might otherwise. For many young people, the objective information we're able to share with them is actually something they can, they can bring back to their parents. So if they come from a household where the parents might be saying, there's no way, no how my kid's gonna become a plumber or an electrician or a carpenter, the individual is now equipped to show them why this might be a good choice and just engage in a different conversation that's got some objective information in it that, could, that can help sway the parent's decision. So TDG's job is to drive as many people as they possibly can to the site. From all backgrounds, all walks of life, they, they, they lean hard into social media, um, they use billboards, they, um, you know, they do traditional advertising as well. The, uh, there's a space on the website also for employers who are interested in learning more and maybe participating in the process, so that takes the employers, potential employers, down a different pathway. And, and at the end of the day, we have learned that if they can drive just enough people to the site, we're going to find an abundance of people who are well suited to this job. The other piece that we found along the way, by the way, is um, you know, there are about 20,000 people who have now come through this process who either opted out or are not really a good fit for this universe of skilled trades, but they are a really great fit for other occupations that are really in demand. So we've now got the data where we can go back to those individuals, we can go to employers. So for example, we're having a, a conversation with Compass Group now, uh, which is unfolding. So they're a large institutional food service company. We found, I think, 600 and some people in the database who are really well suited to either be cafeteria workers or cooks in institutional food service or housekeeping. And so we're now able to go back to those folks and say, well, sorry, this didn't work out, but have you thought about maybe this as an option? And so it creates a bit of a safety net so that you know, as, we, as we build this and as we scale it beyond just the soy envelope, we really can build a model where nobody's left behind. So the piece that we do um, is really rooted to this question that I asked at the very beginning. I mean, we know that organizations really have not done a good job historically of, of matching talent with opportunity. And so what we bring to the equation is a, a behavioral job matching engine that is really designed to screen a large number of people at high volume and provide accurate information. The reason we do that is, um, you know, the, the, in, in many respects, remember when I said, I, I shared with you the, the discomfort of my work in corporations where I couldn't go back to the CEO and say, HR is doing everything right because it isn't working? One of, the, um, one of the bits of research that we stumbled across at the time that really has been at the center of a lot of our communication, and this is um, out of the University of Manchester in the UK, and I share this with HR audiences all day long. I share it with executive teams all day long because it really does speak to how twisted and upside down our conventional approach is to how we screen talent. So really what you see on the left-hand side is all of the bits of information that an organization would collect about people as they're taking them through the screening process, right? So it starts with education, training, experience, interests. Where are you gonna find that? What's the document you're gonna to read to figure that out? Person's resume, right? So we'll look at those things and make arbitrary decisions about who we're gonna look at and who we're gonna ignore. Then we'll take them through an interview or you know, sometimes a phone screen and an interview. We might do reference checks. If we're really on our game and it's a really important position in the organization, we might actually have them complete a behavioral assessment which will measure their behavioral fit for the job and critical thinking and reasoning. But the, the, the reality is many of those assessments are expensive, they're cumbersome, so if a company's gonna use them, they're gonna reserve them just for the final two or three on the short list before they, they look at them. So, so here's the paradox. The numbers down the right-hand side are the predictive value of each of those bits of data. What do you notice? The stuff in the resume is the absolute weakest predictor of likely success. 
and yet we put the resume on a pedestal. We put it at the very front, of the front end of the process. And as I said, we make up arbitrary rules about who we're going to look at and who we're going to ignore on the basis of information that even if it's true, is completely meaningless to the process. And so, you know, the, the, the stuff that has the most predictive value, the, the, the part about not so much what the person knows and what they've done up until now, but the stuff is much more about who the person is deep down inside. How are they naturally wired from a behavioral standpoint? And are they a fit for this reality or not? We reserve to the very end. So in our process, what we do is we flip this thing on its head. So w when we're working with employers, what we do is we serve up all of the applicants who've applied to their open positions, but everybody's got a fit score beside their name because we've integrated the behavioral questionnaire into the application process, the very first step. So, you know, whether it's our ATS or somebody else's, we collect the resume, they collect the cover letter, they'll take them through some pre-screen questions. The final step is a really short behavioral questionnaire that allows us then to project the person into the job and, and assign a fit score. So for employers now, the twist is they're not starting with the resume, they're starting with the people who've got the highest fit scores. And they'll look at those individuals first. And then they'll look at their resumes and they'll see, you know, is this even in the right ballpark or not? Is this something we could work with? But, you know, as employers work with us over time, they discover that even if there's a gap in somebody's skills, knowledge, or experience, that's usually an easier thing to fill if I got somebody who's going to be a strong fit for the job. Hire the person, teach them what they need to know. We've been talking about that stuff for decades, but we've only just really created a system in the last few years that allows employers to do that on a large scale. So how we measure behavioral fit, this isn't voodoo. Um, in fact, you know, we're based on the big five model, which isn't new science. The science itself has been around for about 30 years. Um, it's typically served up in really big and expensive and cumbersome assessments. And so what we've done is we've served it up in a much more nimble way. And we also know that the, the big five traits, which are the ones in bold, um, if, if they're used alone in a job matching process, it's, it's really like using a club when you really would prefer to be using a scalpel. So what we've done is we've teased out an additional 20 much finer distinctions of those big five traits. And those are the, those are the pieces that show up in the questionnaire as part of the application process with employers. It's also what shows up in the questionnaire when somebody shows up at the soy site. So we're collecting the same information as we would for an employer for soy the difference is, not only are we serving it up for soy, not only are we serving it up for their employers, but we're also presenting it back to the individual to help them figure out, as I said earlier on, whether this might be a good choice and why or why not. So, so you know, that somebody's getting meaningful information back. As we project them into the electrician job, we can show them where are the traits where you're in the zone, you know, the ideal range for each of the traits that are critical in that specific job, and where do they land outside the range. And so, um, as you can gather, you know, this process, even though we serve it up on a large scale and we process thousands of people, the information that we generate is deeply person-centric. It is very much about the individual at their core and the, and the tools that we create for employers in the process, the interview guides and that sort of thing, are based on the one-to-one -one relationship between that individual and the job that they're applying to. So it, it really goes very, very deep. Partly because of that, what we hear most often from employers after they've been using the process for a few months is, you know, we're, we're starting to appreciate the value of fit because the people that we're hiring are, and then fill in the blank. It could be they're onboarding faster, they're staying longer, they're performing better. You know, they're taking friction out of my operation. Whatever the qualifier is that the employer will use, but almost always they'll finish the sentence by leaning back in their chair and tilting their head to one side and saying, and you know what? A lot of these great people we've brought on are folks we'd never have hired in a million years based on anything in their resume. It's, it, you know, we just, there's nothing there that would have caught our attention. So we're helping people find as what, you know, what one client described as great people in surprising packages and the outcomes work really well. So as we talk about this consortium, we've got the marketing company that drives traffic. There's us who are screening people into the process and providing that job board to, you know, the, 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 the talent exchange, essentially the labor exchange that matches people with employers. 
to the right of us, next downstream, is a company called um, Validate. Actually, the product's Validate. The company's name is Vimetric. Um, they also have been around for about 20 years. They started in the UK in the apprenticeship space, um, and they've now moved their, uh, their headquarters to Canada to re really begin to target and open up the, the North American marketplace. They take all of the complexity of documenting learning, documenting skills, and put it online. So if you think of all the messiness, think of about apprenticeship process, right? So somebody needs to, as an apprentice, they need to be able to demonstrate their skill to the satisfaction of an employer. Somebody's got to observe them. Somebody's got to pull out a logbook and say, yes, here are, the, here are the skills that I've observed that the person can do competently. Somebody needs to sign them off. The logbook often gets lost, it gets misplaced, it gets forgotten, it doesn't get used. Often you get people who are coming to the end of the first, second, third year of their apprenticeship and they say, they say oh crap, I need, to, I need to get somebody to sign me off on three years worth of learning. It's, it's a mess. Validate takes all of that and puts it online. So literally, an apprentice can turn on their phone, videotape themselves performing the task, whether it's screwing in an electrical box or doing some wiring or what have you, upload it to the cloud. Somebody else's phone pings, they observe the person doing the job, they sign it off, boom, it's done. It's current, it's up to date, it takes all the friction out of it for the apprentice and for the person who needs to sign them off. It creates this logbook, so even you know, any, anybody who's an administrator or an intermediary in this process who is monitoring the entire process knows exactly how learning is happening. Um, they can reach out proactively if somebody seems to be behind on getting their sign-offs or getting things done, so it helps everybody stay on track. Interesting fact that, um, that might catch you by surprise, it might not. Who do, you th who do you think are the apprentices in this world who are most on top of their, their certifications and their, and their documentation in the logbook online? Females. Females. Well, no, not, oh, duh. But, but it's the kind of thing, honestly, where uh, it, it, it's, it's still a lumpy world in terms of access, right? And so females, people of color, others who, you know, are, are thank God, finally entering a workspace, a workplace that has been dominated by mm, older European men for such a long time, um, they are the ones sometimes who have to push most for the learning. And because they have to push most for the learning, they're the ones who are making sure that they get the documentation, the certification done. And, and it's working like a charm for, um, for those folks in the ecosystem. And so it's because of the entirety of what I've talked about this morning that Soy has been able to deliver the results that I shared with you at the, at the, at the beginning. When I asked them, you know, what are, the, what, are the, what are the two key shifts that you see um, Stephen said, you know, there's two things. One is the importance of being able to screen people in versus screen people out, which kind of speaks for itself, right? It's, it's instead of creating barriers and starting from the resume and making up rules about what we're going to look at and what we're going to ignore, instead what we're doing is we're, we're creating an equal opportunity for everybody who's interested to come in and figure out whether this might be something for them. And because of that, we're, we're finding these great people in surprising packages. We're finding people who really are well suited to the job, who are different from the people we've been talking to all, you know, over the course of years. And the fact that we can screen them in and provide a welcome place for them is a huge differentiator. He said the other piece, he said, what I, what I would say is there's a big difference between leaning in and leaning out. And so when you think about that stat that I shared with you at the, at the beginning of the conversation, right, where 20% of um, managers and people who hired them are thumbs up saying this was a great choice. In the traditional model, nobody's got a lot of confidence in the HR process, in the hiring process, right? People get hired all day long, not really sure if this is right for them. And so if you get hired into a job and you're not really sure if this is the right company or the right job, you're going to show up on day one kind of like this, right? You're going to be cautious. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna show up, you're going to do what you're asked to do, but are you going to roll up your sleeves and engage fully and take risks? No, you're going to wait for some kind of sign that 
this is a place where I can roll up my sleeves, where I can take risks, where my effort and my risk taking and my willingness to engage is going to be recognized and appreciated. So I'm going to lean back a little bit waiting for this sign from heaven that says this is the right place for me to put down roots. And guess what? Manager's doing exactly the same thing. The, the conversation between their ears when somebody gets hired is, well, this is the sixth dodo that HR has sent me in the last two weeks. I'm going to wait for some kind of sign that, I, that this person's worth investing in. So I'll go through the paces, but am I going to take them under my wing? No. They need to show me something. So in most situations, for most people, people who've gone through this dance more than once in the last couple of years. The initial posture is like this, both for the individual and their manager, waiting for signs. And what we see in this environment is it's completely different. People are leaning in from the beginning. Individuals know why they're there. Individuals know the support system that's around them. Individuals know why they're really well suited to this and why it's a good choice for them. And the contractors on the other side of the equation have exactly the same posture because they know the screening process people have gone through. And they've probably, in most cases, already hired an apprentice or two and seen how well it's worked out. And so they're coming in, and the initial posture is completely different from, from what we see in most workplaces. They're leaning in. And when both parties are leaning in, the level of commitment's different, the level of engagement's different, and the amount of learning that's possible becomes completely different as well. So um, I want to make sure that we leave some time. Uh, if, if we had more time, I'd share with you um, uh, Samim's story. So he's, he's a perfect poster child for what Soy has created. This is a newcomer to Canada who came from Pakistan, who's Muslim, whose skin is not the color of most Western Europeans. He's different across just about every metric you can imagine. And frankly, coming into the process, um, it was a bit tough. But thank goodness for Samim that Soy was there and was able to connect him with the right employers and was able to provide the safety net. I mean, he's now, I think, three years in and, um, and is on fire. And he is now a testament to the process and shows up in, in many of their social media fields. Um, um, as I said earlier on, this is now expanded to other construction trades, it's expanded to a number of industrial trades. Uh, through Napa Auto Pro, soy is expanding into the automotive sector this coming year uh, in the automotive trades. Um, they're reaching out specifically to targeted populations in ways that they haven't, so new Canadians and women's, uh, and, and, and they're enlisting people who are currently in the process to be buddies and mentors for new people coming in. So that's how they're really investing heavily in teaching people to do this, but not just for the sake of being nice. It really does strengthen the social fabric of people who are, who are participating in the program. Um, one of the initiatives that Soy engaged in this past year was, I think, a little piece of brilliance. They, um, they received a grant specifically to take um, the show on the road. So they shrink-wrapped a pickup truck, they shrink-wrapped shrink a trailer, pulled together a bunch of tradespeople, and they put together a road show that saw them visit 70 high schools around the province, running one-day pre-apprenticeships for young people who were maybe in CTE, maybe not, but who were curious about the trades. We were part of that process, so we were screening kids into these events uh, on the basis that they're likely fit, so kids knew why they were there. The one day consisted of safety training, it consisted of uh, an introduction to the tools and actually getting hands-on with the tools. And in many cases, the kids were making themselves a souvenir they could take home at the end of the day. They were engaging with real tradespeople, learning about the upsides and the downsides, what it's really all about. They received so uh, soft skills training, interview training, um, and everybody who showed up walked away with a tool belt that had $250 worth of tools in it for them to take home. Their thought was, you know, if we, if we do this really, really well, we might be able to sign up 250 people to register training agreements. 600 and, actually, that number is low. I think the final number was 667 people, young people, signed registered training agreements to become apprentices. 
out of this initiative. Absolutely blew the doors off. And um, the number is actually higher, 18% were women. And they actually ran a couple of sessions that were all female. And, and they actually hired their first female millwright apprentice out of, I think, the third or fourth session that they ran. So enormous success in terms of the outreach to help kids understand why maybe they should be doing this. So for them, um, you know, obviously there's, there's an awful lot to be proud of. Um, you know, there's, there's some stuff that just continues to grate and generate friction. Um, you know, a lot of it actually has to do with the interaction with the government <laughs> and, and, the, and the initiatives that they have in place that are supposed to make the process better and really just end up um, generating friction. And as I said earlier on, their, their, their next step is investing more in, um, in different programs or different mentorships. What's neat for us is this has opened the door to work in a whole slew of different industries. So we've got similar programs in place. They're not all apprenticeships, and they're not all in the skilled trades. So as, as you see, just looking around the, the horn there, we're doing some work with the automotive sector. We're doing some work in um, financial services. We're doing some work with uh, NAB2, which is the North American Building Trades Union. So that's more like what we're doing with soy, but it's in the trade union setting. Um, Landscape Ontario to bring people into their apprenticeships. The, the project that we're just kicking off is the one in the center here, which is um, uh, in the food production industry. So they have the same perception as the trades in many respects. The entry level, the, the entry level jobs are frankly not attractive. So what we're doing in that industry is we're saying to people who are coming to the site, okay, here might be where, you, where you're going to start your career, but at the same time what we're doing is we're taking their behavioral thumbprint and we're projecting them into an org chart for the industry that includes careers in finance, it includes careers in HR, it includes finance and operations and all slew of other opportunities that people can grow into in the industry, sales, marketing, you name it. And so the position now is, look, here's, here's where you may start, but here's where you can grow your career in the industry, which for somebody who's approaching it shifts their focus entirely to something that is bigger, longer term, and in many cases more attractive than just working on the plant floor gutting chickens all day long in order to feed my family. Yeah, I can do that, but I also, if I apply myself and I'm willing to grow, I can do some different things. And uh, these slides talk about what we're doing in community colleges and a few other places, and I just want to leave those for just a second because we've already covered an awful lot of ground this morning, and I want to make sure in the few minutes we have left that... Um, that we can answer questions and have this be conversational. So thank you for being here, and, and let's talk. What, what comes to mind? What questions do you have? Let me maybe back right up. I mean, is, is that intermediary, is that group sponsor model something you see as possible in the worlds that you're operating in? It's a mind shift. There's no question. So what are the what what resistance points do you see, Dan? Okay. Yep. So can, oh, so, so Ontario's got the same thing, right? Perfect. Um, so can you can you just speak to the relationship between like a group sponsor and then that that government entity and sort of what that looks like, how that relationship gets built, and yep. some of the functions yep. that, that are there? So you so you've got state departments of apprenticeship. We've got apprenticeship office, which is part of the Ministry of Labor and Skills Development, Minister of Labor Training and Skills Development. I don't know they change the name every couple of years just to keep the pulp and paper industry in business. I think. Um, but the, 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 the relationship is um, arm's length, right? So in, in Soy's case, the grant comes from that ministry. They do whatever dance the, the, the ministry requires of them or the Department of Apprenticeship requires of them from an administrative standpoint. And for the rest of it, they try to keep them out, right? So, so they'll do the reports, but they really don't want the help from the government office to try to make the process better because they'll end up botching it. So it's, it's, we're happy to take your money, we're happy to generate these fabulous results, 
We're happy to send you the reports that make you look good. Just leave us alone to get on with what we do best. Don't know if that helps, but that's, that's sort of, I think, how Stephen would describe it. Anybody else? Yes, hi. Tell me. Yeah, it's good. Um, so I guess I feel like an intermediary's job is in helping the organization and the training entity kind of develop and create a new apprenticeship. And what you're kind of presenting here is a model in which you're taking the participant through screening and onboarding into an apprenticeship role which is more individually driven than program driven. Am I wrong in seeing that? I, I, I think, Heather, the answer is both, right? So, so SOI's focus is on both sides of the ledger uh, in the sense that, yes, they're intensely focused on the individual and making sure that this is the right decision for them and in providing that safety net that I mentioned. They're doing every bit the same thing on behalf of the employer or you know, the organizations that are participating. Because one of the biggest buy-ins for my participants into an apprenticeship yeah. has been that quick to earn, mm -hmm. um, you know, earning potential from day one, yep. quick entry, quick payday kind of model. Yeah, and the ability when, to grow your pay, to ladder it, right? Right. And then, you know, at a living wage, at a sustainable mm -hmm. wage, even though that's an entry wage, you know. But... The more that ramp up, preparation, screening, are you the right fit kind of process goes on, the less, ah. the more time it takes to get to that quick entry um, uh, grabbing point for youth. So, so there's a lot going on under the hood and a lot of it's under the hood, Heather. The, the, from, from somebody's visit to the website to actually getting screened in as an apprentice and being assigned to an employer and having a registered training agreement signed could be as little as two or three days. It's, there's, there's a lot of moving parts, and a lot of them are, our, our stuff's all online and automatic, so it's immediate gratification for the individual. The, the reports to SOI, the reports that are available to employers, all of that is instantaneous. And so, you know, it really is as, as, as quick as somebody applying, getting a phone screen, being invited in for skills tests, you know, some skills tests and numeracy tests and that kind of thing, getting interviewed, being presented with the opportunity, and they could start work the next day. So, you know, there's, there's no shortage of opportunities that people can be connected with. That help? Yeah, I think so. Because right now it's a scary process for so many unknowns. I don't know how to get kids into this opportunity. That's why having a single entity for them to go to and having a marketing company that's driving them there is part of the secret sauce here. That's that's what scales up the numbers. Right, but it's not if it's not a registered apprenticeship with the state, I can't spend the million dollars. So okay, I, I can't, I can't, I can't speak to that. Yeah. Okay. So, and that may tie in with Dan's question to some extent. So here's here's the thing: from a structural standpoint, there are going to need to be some differences in this environment versus in Ontario. I I get that because funding sources are different, um, and all the rest of that, and. I have to think that those are structural and logistical things that are easy enough for someone to sort out and once they're in place. Uh, so for example, in two weeks, I'm, um, I'm flying out to Idaho, partly to speak at the, the, the Idaho Manufacturers Alliance Association, but partly also because they're walking us into State Department of Labor, State Department of Education, and the, the Office of Apprenticeship, because they're really interested in the SOI model and, and, and in trying to figure out how to make it work in Idaho, even if the starting point is just advanced manufacturing jobs. So there's, when you can present a bigger solution and an innovative solution, what we're finding is there's open ears. Because my, my, 
I, I keep being told that there are all these apprenticeship dollars rolling out from the DOL that nobody knows how to spend. And everybody's looking for an innovative approach. Well, the innovative approach may not fit in the existing box completely. So maybe we need to adjust the size and shape of the box a little bit. Mimi, I'm sorry. Well, to your point, because we had a little pre-conversation, those DOL and different types of grants are out there. Build in marketing as part of your mm. piece, of your ask. I mean, sometimes they don't fund what they don't know. Right. Um, I'm going to come back and try to be as creative as possible and build in that whole marketing component that I'm not using YO dollars. I'm going to use the dollars they're going to award to us with, a, with the purpose slated for marketing and outreach in that way. I mean, yeah. it, that statistic you can't, with that wraparound bus that went around 1,400 and you got 621 applications, that's huge. Yeah. Yes, it is. It's huge. <laughs> okay, now my, my plug for the survey, y'all. You got to put in your 3900C. Okay. Code. Okay. Thank you so much. And let's give our speaker a round of applause. I think um, you did a great speech. I appreciate all your endurance on a weary Wednesday morning. Thank you.